Okay. Well, they haven't met. Thankfully, we haven't met too much. But um, okay. Yeah. Since I um, just sorry to have this on the recording, I haven't said much. Just that this was a just as a quick summary of what I just said. So that this was the limit definition of the derivative, and if you're looking. Now we're looking at situations where the derivative may not exist, okay? So the problem that uh, if you look, for example, at absolute value of x that this may have at the origin is that at the origin, there seems to be two potential tangent lines um, at the origin. So that could be an issue, and we're going to check that, in fact, this is an issue uh, using the limit definition of the derivative. Right, so if you look at the definition of the derivative, um, I'm replacing f with the absolute value. And so now uh, this is what I would get. But again, uh, this is like a formula for the derivative at any point x. I don't want the formula for the slope of the tangent line at any point. I just care about what's going on here, right? So we just want the value of this limit at x equals zero. So uh, when you put x equals zero in this limit, you get, um, this is how you would write it, f prime of zero, because I'm substituting x with this zero. This would be the limit as h approaches zero of zero plus h minus absolute value of zero divided by h. Okay, so that's the, the only thing that I'm doing here, again, is substituting x with zero. So let me put that uh, in different colors to make it clear. Um, okay. And so what happens here, you get uh, that f prime of zero would be the limit as h approaches zero. Okay, like the absolute value of zero plus h is just the absolute value of h. The absolute value of zero is just zero, so you don't even have to put it. And so you just get the absolute value of h divided by h. Okay, and hopefully this looks like a familiar limit that we have done before. Um, anyone remembers why this limit does not exist? Uh, is it the, the left? Uh, okay, you're kind of on the right track. Um, the the what it has it's not that the one sided limits do not exist. They do exist. It's just that they're different. Okay, so if you remember, um, let me put it here. Like the limit as h approaches zero from the right. Th when you do that, like then you can replace absolute value with just h. So you would get h over h. We just that's just one. And then you had the limit of absolute value. I mean, you had this limit, this one-sided limit from the left. And what you and what happens here is that you can replace the absolute value with minus h. So that one gives you minus one. So again, it's not that the limit the one-sided limits do exist, it's just that they are different. Okay, so so, so this does not exist since the one-sided limits are different. Is that making sense? And so that's kind of, and the fact that the, these two one-sided limits are different is kind of like related to this thing that earlier that I showed you in the graph, because if, again, if you look at the graph of absolute value at the origin, there seems to be like two tangent lines and each tangent line would have like its own slope. So the slope for one line would have been one and the slope for the other line would have been negative one. And this is kind of like what the one-sided limits are letting you know. So in general, like um, what's happening here is that uh, more visually or like in terms of the picture, like the problem arose because like there's some sort of like corner 
right um, a corner uh, on the on the graph at the origin. So and that's kind of like a good rule of thumb to know when uh, uh, visually when like a function has no derivative at a, par a particular point. So let me write that down. So this is like more like of a visual interpretation. So, so what um, what I'm like when it happens in general is that if the graph of f of x has some sort of corner, um, uh, yeah. Uh, so if the graph of f of x has some sort of corner, at some point, at a point x, Then f prime, the derivative or the slope, then the derivatives f prime of x won't exist there, will not exist. So just to give you like a picture of what I mean, so you could have something like Again, like he could here could be the graph. Um, Okay, so if I, okay, let's see. If I gave you this graph, uh, based on this graph, how many points, if you had to like, and there will be like, there's usually like a problem of this sort um, on the exams or the quizzes where you're just given like a graph and you have to recognize potential issues. So um, in this graph, like at least uh, how many points do you think could be problematic? Um, how many look like could give you uh, some sort of issue? Yeah, that looks about right. I mean, of course, like when you're drawing it on pencil, like uh, uh, there can be always some wiggle room, uh, but the two main ones, like the obvious ones are like this one, and this one, right? Um, so, so two points where the derivative wouldn't, two points where you wouldn't expect the derivative to exist. Uh, derivative will not exist. Is that making sense? <laughs> so visually, in a sense, um, when uh, when the derivative exists, it's always like actually you should think about it as in this, in this case is um, oh I, well um, I just got a question on the chat about continuity and I, I'll go to this uh, in a second. So that was going to be the second thing that I talk about. But for now, like think about this as a sort of roller coaster, right? And if uh, these, if you were designing this like uh, on Disney or Bush Gardens, whatever is your favorite entertainment uh, park, 
this would be like a dangerous roller coaster, right? Like for uh, whoever takes this ride, because they're like too, like, you know, if you're like, uh, if the if you're in the roller coaster, like you don't want to actually have like these sorts of corners. Like in a sense, you want like the curve to actually move like, like, you know, change more like uh, slowly or like smoothly is like word that you actually use, right? You don't want like tra sharp, turns uh which is kind of what happens at these corners you want something like more subtle and so in terms like of actual curves the curves when they have sharp turns or corners it is that's like the point where you wouldn't expect the derivative to exist okay um so that's why um uh you know like visually uh, it's a good thing to to have in mind uh there's this other thing um uh, the other thing I was going to say, uh, which is even worse, is like related to continuity. So, um, so, but this is uh, this is like a first thing. So, if, if there are corners, definitely you cannot expect a derivative at the point where the corner is located. So that's the first thing. The second thing, uh, visually, is that if there's like a discontinuity, you cannot expect a derivative as well, either. So let's put this as a second observation. Um, if the derivative, sorry, if the function is not continuous at a point A, then uh, the derivative cannot exist. Then F prime of X or the derivative does not exist at this point. Okay, so let me put this again, like in some sort of box. So like, what what did it mean for there to be a discontinuity uh, or what does it mean for the function to be not continuous, right? So there could be like um, one possibility, like in terms of like the visuals of how this could look like, it's like a, there's a literal, literal jump, right? So for example, like if you remember, like um, a function which is not continuous at some given value could look like this. Right, so maybe here you have a, right? And so like, here's a graph of f of x. And I mean, it r roughly looks plausible, right? That, uh, <laughs> you know, there's kind of something that's going to be a bit off if you're trying to find like a tangent line to this curve at that point, right? It, it's kind of plausible that there should not be like a tangent line here because like there's a literal, literal gap in the function, right? So it may, like, you know, it, it will be like a bit off if you try to do that. The other thing that could happen, um, in terms of discontinuities, right? Is that there was just some sort of hole. So maybe the function looks like this. Right, like um, this, like some here just trying to indicate that there's some hole that you drill on the graph and you put like the value of the function at A somewhere else, right? Uh, 
So the other thing that could happen is that there's some sort of hole on the with the graph of the function. And I mean, maybe this one is less obvious um, that there shouldn't be like a, a slope of the tangent line. Um, so like, um, I'm going to kind of prove prove it for you that um, kind of like uh, this actually will be the case. So, but I'm just saying, like in maybe in this possible in this op possibility, it's more clear that this should not have a derivative. Okay, let me put it uh, indicate this here. So f prime should not exist in either case. So what I'm saying is that in this case, um, uh, there's a gap and, and in this case there's a hole, but in, in both possibilities there, there should not be a derivative. Okay, so um, is that making sense uh, pictorially? So uh, again, like whenever you see the graph of a function, if there are holes or jumps, then there's also a place where um, you would say that there's no derivative. So the way I'm going to show this, um, that this does happen, is a slightly different way of how I'm writing it. I'm going to show it in the way that whenever f prime exists, f of x has to be continuous. Um, so let me, prove it this way, which is it's just a little bit easier to, to prove. Um, it's called like the contrapositive. If you ever need to take a course like in proof theory or or computer science where like people go into proofs of things in discrete math, math, I'm going to prove for you the, the contrapositive. So here's like what I'm going to prove. What I'm going to prove is that whenever f prime of x is, exists, f of x is continuous at a. So what this is saying is that if there is a derivative, the function is continuous there, right? So whenever there's a discontinuity, there could not exist a derivative because if there existed one, then the function would be continuous. That's it's kind of like a word salad game, but um, it is a, basically the same as what I was saying or, uh, above um, what I just wrote. So what was the limit of, uh, okay, let me give you a chance to uh, copy this. And before I, I, I start this, like, I don't know if there are any questions up to this point. Maybe I should stop here first. Okay, so uh, what does it mean to prove that um, the function is continuous to show f of x is continuous at a? Uh, we need to show that um, the limit of as x approaches a of f of x. Okay, this is a question from the first exam uh, um, of yesterday. What should this limit be if the function is continuous?
So what is right? What is this limit for a continuous function? It's just f of a good. Uh now that's the same uh kind of convenient to to draw, draw this you can write also as can also write this as the limit as x approaches a of f of x minus f of a equals zero. So you can subtract f of a on both sides and just put it inside the limit. It looks a little bit silly, but I mean, they are the same thing because this is just a number and you can move like a number inside of a limit if you want. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is kind of like the clever thing of this, of argue, of this proof which is that you can multiply and divide by x minus a. So it's kind of analogous to these problems of limits where we were multiplying and dividing by the conjugate of, of an expression, but instead of multiplying by a conjugate, we're just going to multiply by x minus a. So, uh, by the way, sorry, I should put this, like, emphasize this more clearly. This is what I want to show. I don't know this part yet. So this is what I want to show. So what I'm saying is that to show that what I'm doing is just like taking the left-hand side of this equation and multiplying it by x minus a, x minus a. And then what I'll do is do a change of variables. So I'm going to do a change of variables similar to the ones we did uh, before. Um, I'm going to call x minus a the denominator h, and you'll see why in a moment. So let's start with the easy part. If I call x minus a, x minus a h, the bottom becomes h, right? This part becomes h, right? Now, here's a more important thing. If I ch x was approaching a, right? So if x is approach was approaching a, what's, what is h approaching here? It's approaching zero, good. And then f of a is still f of a. That's nothing happens there because that's just a constant. But what is f of x? How can I wrote, write f of x in terms of h? Right, if you make this change of variables, then this is saying that x is a plus h. So you can replace f of x with f of a plus h. Is that making sense? But now, uh, what does this remind you of? Uh, hopefully this starts looking a lot more familiar. What is this expression for what thing does this uh, expression appear?
It is a limit definition of the derivative. So in fact, we're almost there. So if, if you, this limit can be split into two, And this, the first one is just f prime of a. And the second one, what is the limit of h as h approaches zero? That's just zero. So you get f prime of a times zero, and that's just zero. And so that's why this limit, that's why this limit is zero. And that's essentially what you wanted to show, um, to say that it was continuous. Okay. Uh, so they, uh, just to summarize of everything of what I have said at the moment, this is really like the only two important things that you need to remember of what I've said. So from what I've said is that if there are corners, where did I have the corners? If there are corners like these two points, then there's no derivative at those two points, right? And also if there are gaps or holes, there's also no derivative. So visually the bad places, like the summary of what I have said is that the bad places for for like the function, for like the derivative will, derivative will not exist, it are like corners, holes, and uh, jumps of the function. So like, let me just write that as a summary of the discussion. So to summarize, F prime of X does not exist at the points uh, with corners, holes, or jumps. And if you remember these three things, that's more or less uh, important thing of what I have said so far. Is that making sense? Okay, so then the other thing that I wanted to do today was to continue more like in the in the spirit of how to compute this derivative. So for that, we need more derivative rules, like of, of actually how the, uh, the derivative can be computed. So that's a little bit slight slightly different topic of what I have been doing up to this point. So let's take a five minute break, meet at 150, and then I'll start telling you more about this derivative rule. Um, but yeah, let's, let's do a short break in case you want to grab something to drink or uh, water or go to the bathroom. And then I'll continue with that, that topic. Okay, uh, so let's continue. Uh, the first thing actually is that I need to give you an alternative notation <laughs> for the derivative. And this will be, um, it's kind of weird, but one of the things that happens in calculus is that there are many different ways to just like refer to the same object. In the sense, there are many different ways to write it down uh, in terms like uh, of its notation. But it's just that it's actually this other notation is very convenient and it does uh, give you a lot of more like memorization. It facilitates to memorize certain things. So this is called the Leibniz notation of the derivative uh, just because that Leibniz was like, one of the two big um, inventors of 
of calculus. So Newton was a second person. I mean, of course, there were other people involved, but that's usually the two that get the most of the credit for coming up with calculus. So. Okay. So here's the, let's go back to the picture that I had done for the derivative. And you'll see why, again, in a moment that this is a useful notation to have. Okay, so if you remember, uh, here's y equals f of x. For the derivative, what am I going to do? I'm going to choose a point x. And let's see which colors I want to use. Uh, let me put here x, here x plus h. Actually, let me move up. Let me make the graph a little bit more convenient. Okay, I think this will be better. Okay, so here's the value of x. For this value of x, you have f of x, right? And uh, here is the value of x plus h. And for this value of f of, of x plus h, you have f of x plus h, right? So uh, in the line uh, in the Leibniz notation um, this is also more similar to the notation you would see in many physics courses and things like that. In the Leibniz notation, um you have like this change, you know, there's a difference between X and X plus H or like a distance between them, which is just H, <laughs> but it's more common to call it Delta X. So you, let me put this Delta, write this as Delta X. So Delta X is going to be the change in X from X to X plus H. So delta x just means how much a the variable x has changed. Uh, delta, I mean, it looks like a triangle, but that's just for the Greek letter. Like this is kind of the same letter that you see in this in the fraternity fraternities all over the, U, the U.S. campuses, U.S. universities, right? So it's a delta from you know uh, the Greek alphabet. So this just means like delta x is just like a, another way to say change in x. Doesn't mean like that you're multiplying two things. So this is just means, um, this does not, not mean that you're multiplying x by a, a, a letter delta. Okay, <laughs> it can be, this is why it can be a slightly confusing thing. Uh, so it does not mean you're multiplying, not mean you are multiplying x by delta. Think of it as a single name, basically. Is that making sense up to this point, like the not that notation? So again, it's just I cannot a new name that we're giving uh to to how much you have to change the the variable x. Okay. 
And also, uh, there's a corresponding change if you think about it in how much the 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 variable or the uh, the function changes, right? So that's what you'll see in a moment why this notation is useful right now. So there is a change, right? Which you see here. Or there's a change. There's there's this vertical change, right? Which I'm uh, pointing at you, which is how much f changes, right? And this is called delta f. So delta f just means how much the function changes. Change in the function from f of x to f of x plus h. Is that making sense? So again, it does not mean a multiplication, right? It does not mean a mul uh, you are multiplying uh, f by delta. So whenever in calculus you see this funny symbol for the triangle, the delta, uh, again, it is not like a symbol that lives on its own. It is always accompanied. It's always together with something else. And so the two things together mean change. They don't mean like each of the, each of them individually does not have like, a, it's um, it's separate. It does, it's not like a separate, uh, an individual symbol. It is like a single symbol for these two things. It just has two, two letters, but you should think about it as a single quantity, if that makes sense. Is that okay? So uh, from this perspective, right, remember, what was the definition of f prime uh, for f prime of x? f prime of x was just the limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x over h, right? That was the limit definition of the derivative. But let's try now what we're going to try to do is to uh, replace these same quantities with, just in terms of the new notation that we are studying. So what is, what in terms of the two new symbols that I gave you, right, what can you replace the numerator with? What is f of x plus h minus f of x in this picture? Uh, it is, uh, right, it is, well, it is delta F, right? Because this, uh, this is just how much, if you think about it, this is comparing how much is like, taking the difference between these two numbers. So it just gives you like the value for this distance, right? Or like uh, this, the length of this interval. So that's what we're calling delta F. So this, the numerator is just really delta F. Is that making sense? Uh, and then, is that okay with everyone? Are there questions about that? So again, like the numerator is just computing uh, how much F changes. And so that's like what we literally we're calling delta F. And you, the denominator was, what is H? What H is literally the length of this interval, right? It's just that that interval is now being called delta X. Again, it's like a change of names, uh, but I, one that, again, will be convenient soon. So 
So the derivative can also be written as the limit uh, as instead of saying h approaches zero, so now you would say delta x approaches zero. Is that, is that okay? And so this is why it's important to realize that this is like each of these is its own symbol. Because if this were literally like a multiplication, then you would say, well, let's just cancel the deltas. But that actually does not make sense. Like, it does not make sense to just cancel out the deltas because, again, like the deltas are kind of like glued. Like, they're kind of, these two are like stick together by glue and these two are together by glue. So you, they're not really two separate. They look like separate symbols, but it's just like an accident of how it's written down. It is, it doesn't, it is, each of them is kind of its own entity its own thing. So that's why you can now just cancel out the delta, if that makes sense. Uh, the nice thing about this notation is that it looks more like, kind of like how you remember the formula for, for a slope, because a formula for the slope is kind of like the difference in y, or the difference in f in this case, divided by the difference in x, right? So it looks like more like this rise over run, run formula. And although in, based on that, on the fact that this looks more like a ratio that you recognize, the alternative to writing this as f prime of x is to write this. Uh, so, so instead of writing f prime of x, the Leibniz notation writes this as df dx. Uh, Leibniz. So again, this this mean it is exactly the same as f prime of x. So again, this thing is the same as f prime of x, and it's the same as this thing. And it's also the same as this thing. So all of these things mean the same. It's just that this one, if you write it, if you write the derivative this way, I'm uh, sorry, let me give me a second. If you write the derivative this way, it reminds you more that there's some sort of like ratio involved in the definition uh, in terms of a limit. So it is convenient to write it in that, in that way because of that. So if someone writes, says f prime of x, that's the same as saying d f d x. Okay, is that making sense? So uh, let me give you like, just to see more in practice, like what's the difference like in how this is written down. So here are some examples of how the, the different notations look like. So I don't know if anyone remembers f of x equals x squared, right? Anyone remember like what was the derivative of this formula? Of, of the, sorry, of this function. What was the derivative of x squared? 
it was to ask. So there are a couple of ways to write this um, for us. And it is very important to get used to all the different ways to write in this. So one way to write it is just f prime of x equals two x. Okay, that's the first way. The other, another way to write this is that it's like this, which I haven't used, but you can also use um, if you want. Okay, so you could you you write something x two x squared prime equals two x. Okay. And the other way to write this is that d dx of x squared equals 2x, OK? So all these things mean the same, all mean the same. So like the difference like in the last version is that you kind of put the like the function in the numerator of like of, a, of what looks like a fraction. Um and in the other two you just put like you just put like a prime around it basically. Is that making sense? Um Uh, just to give you another one to make sure like this is kind of making sense. Like, what's another one that I gave you last time? Oh, we, we saw the derivative of sine. It was cosine, right? So let's put f of x equals sine of x, right? Again, um, we had found the derivative of sine was cosine. So one way to write that would be that the f prime of x would be cosine of x. Another way to write this is that cosine of x prime would be cosine of x. And a third way to write it now is that d sine dx, that's just cosine. And these all mean the same. Is that making sense? Any questions about this? So let's now, I've, now that I introduced this notation, I can uh, start writing you some derivative rules. Um, it's kind of, it's just that it was useful to have this notation like kind of in place before like giving th those to you. So let me start um, with these um, derivative rules. So let me give you a second first to copy this and then I'll, I'll write. So the first one is kind of very straightforward. And it's like a, a, a rule for sums and diff, um, subtractions. So here's like a rule for sum and sum and diff, uh, sub difference of form of functions. So it just says that if f and g have a derivative at x,
then uh, f plus f of x plus g of x and f of x minus g of x have a derivative of at, at x. So again, I'm going to write it um, in two different ways. Let me see. So what this is going to say is that if you want to take the derivative of a sum, you can just take the individual derivatives and add them together. Or in if you prefer the other notation, again, these two mean the same. If you want to take the derivative of a sum, again, you can take the, der the individual derivatives and add them together. And the idea is that the same works for for, uh, for subtracting formula uh, functions. So if you have like f of x minus g of x, and you want to take a derivative, it's the same as taking the derivative of f of x and subtracting from that the derivative of g of x. Or if you want, uh, again, in the other notation, it would just look like this. Is that okay? Let me put this in a box. I'm about to write some examples. Um, uh, let me put this first, uh, mark this on the box. So what this is saying is that for sums or difference of the functions, um, if you want the derivative of a sum or a difference, like if you just take the individual derivatives and combine them as a, as a, as a, combine them uh, as a sum or a difference, depending on what you were finding. So, so for example, if you wanted the derivative of x squared plus sine of x, right? If you wanted the derivative of this function, remember x squared plus sine of x is a new function, right? So if you wanted the derivative of this new function, that would be two x plus cosine of x, or sorry, let me write it more, more let me write more steps. What this is saying is that you can, take the derivative of x squared and take the derivative of sine of x and just combine them. So that would be two x plus cosine of x. Is that making sense? Uh, is that okay with everyone? And the same happens, uh, I mean, again, like the same happens in the other notation. Like it, it is more useful to write it um, in this notation for some, in this particular case, it is advantageous because if you write it in this way, it looks like that you can kind of distribute this thing. You know, it looks more like a distributive rule. So um, it looks, uh, it is easier to memorize. That's why what I was referring to when I was saying that this notation is sometimes it's easier to, to memorize because again, it looks like you're just distributing Is that okay? So, uh, and the same would happen if you had like a, a minus, there's no difference. So if I had said like, well, I want the derivative of x cubed minus x squared, 
that would be the derivative of x cubed minus the derivative of x squared. So what, do we, what is the derivative of x cubed? If you remember the power rule, the number three comes down and then you, sub, you decrease the exponent by one. So that actually gives you three x squared, good. And we talked about the other one before, it's two x, right? So it just gives you, gives you minus two x. And again, in the same, in the Leibniz notation, it looks more like a distributive rule, which is why it's nice. Um, is that okay? Questions about this so far so good? So like, just to show you why this rule works, it's like a very simple rule of proof. So why is, why does this formula work for sums? So what is the derivative of f of x plus g of x if you use the limit definition? If you use the limit definition, this would be the, the limit of h goes to zero of f of x plus h my, uh, plus g of x plus h. Oops. Right, because it's a function evaluated at x plus h, and then you have to de subtract the function evaluated at, at x. Divided by h, right? So just to explain why this is happening, if you remember the limit definition, the limit definition, sorry, just to go up, the limit definition was evaluate your function at x plus h. But what is our function now? The function now is the sum. So we have to evaluate the sum at x plus h. That's what I'm doing here. And then you have to subtract the sum at x. So that's what you see there. But then uh, what when you have this limit, the easiest thing to do it's just to break it apart. So I'll just combine this term with this term and this term with this term. So let me write it down. So this is the limit as h approaches zero. What's the green stuff? The green stuff is f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h plus the blue stuff Okay, and if you remember, like the the form, the rules for limits is that you can split limits. So this is why also we were talking about limit rules before. So this is just f prime of x plus g prime of x. So that's why the 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 formula works for sums, and the form proof with difference is the same. Um, you just put like a minus sign here instead of a plus. Uh, is that making sense? Any questions about this? Thank 
Okay, now, okay. So this um, formula for sums or differences is not that bad. Now comes one that is actually tricky and it can be confusing uh, and it's called the product rule. And as you might expect, it is a formula for the product of the two functions, for the derivative of two functions. So um, again, I'll write it down, do an example, and then uh, show it for you. But this one is a little bit more complicated than the other one. So if you have, let me see which colors I'm using. Oh, yeah. So here's rule two, which is called the product rule. Again, this is one of the important ones because it's not so obvious. So it's one that it really requires memorizing. So the product rule says that if you have, if, if f of x, g of x have a derivative at x, then f of x times g of x has a derivative at x. And moreover, so this one gives you um, a formula for the product of the derivatives. So So what makes it diff this one difficult is or trickier is that it's not just multiplying the individual derivatives. It's a little bit more complicated than that. So the rule is you take the derivative of the first one and you do nothing to the second one. And then you do nothing to the first one and, multi and multiply it for by the derivative of the second one and you combine these two uh, results. So it's kind of like you take the derivative of one at a time and you leave the other one alone and then you just combine those two formulas. Okay. Or if you prefer to, um, in the other notation, what this is saying is that the derivative of uh, f times g this is a, the way in which it's written down in the other notation is that the derivative of f times g plus uh, f times the derivative of g with respect to x. Okay. So again, um, it, it shouldn't be clear why this is the way it is. I'm about to explain it in a second. Let me um, do first like an example. It's better to look at an example first uh, before doing this. So yeah, like doing like the proof. So imagine that I asked you for, to, for you to find the derivative of x squared sine of x. Right. If you look at the product formula, what this is saying is take the derivative of the first factor and do nothing to the second factor. And then take the derivative, I mean, then do nothing to the first factor and take the derivative of the second factor and add these two results together. Is that making sense?
once you know that, then like everything else is straightforward. If you remember like the other the, the derivatives we have done before, because the derivative of x squared is two x, and the derivative of sine of x is cosine of x. So that would be the that would be the result. Or if you prefer the other notation. In the other notation, you would say, take the derivative of the first factor and multiply it by the second one, and then do nothing to the first factor and multiply it by the derivative of the second factor. So this is how you would write it in the alternative notation. And so if you write it in this notation, again, it's the same. It's two x sine of x, plus x squared cosine of x. Is that okay? Um, questions about this? Okay, now why is this formula, this rule the way it is? And this is what can get a little bit tricky. So let me try to explain why the product rule works the way it does. So here's like a proof of the product rule. So the idea is, um, you know, If you wanted to find f, f of x, g of x prime using the limit definition, that would be the limit as h approaches zero of f of x plus h times g of x plus h minus f of x, g of x divided by h. Okay. Because again, if you remember the, the limit definition, it is evaluate the function at x plus h, but the function is now the product of, of these two. So the function that we're dealing with is the product. So that's why we're evaluating the product at x plus h and then subtract the function at x, but the function at x is the product. Okay, so that's why the form, the limit looks like way it does. Okay. Um, so far so good? Now here's the trick. Uh, if you thought like just to, for reference, um, if you thought that F and G represented like some sort of like length of a wire. Think think of F and G like being like you have like two vertical, you know, if you had like um uh, like a wire, then F and G represents like the height of the wire with respect to, to the floor. So just for like reference, like imagine that each F and G had like we're measuring some sort of height, right? Or some sort of length. So if this word like had was length, length, and this is length, what is length times length? What does that give you unit or of? Length times length, what is that?
Well, it should be units of area, right? Because it's like feet times feet or meters times meter. That would be feet square feet or it's meter square square meter. So that is like units of area. So what you can do, like just as the picture, um, again, you shouldn't take it too literally, but it's a convenient picture, is that you could think of like having like a rod, think of F and G, like two sort of two sorts of rods. So here you have F of X and G of X. So you have like a mini rectangle. And that's why, uh, and then this rectangle would have area F of X times G of X. Is that making sense? And in fact, that's kind of like how the Greeks would think about multiplying numbers or lengths, that if you had like a, a number times another number, that's kind of giving you the area. Multiplying two numbers was like giving you the area of a rectangle. Uh, that's why they more or less could not deal with negative numbers because, you know, what would be a negative length and things like that. And also that makes it complicated to multiply more than three numbers because at least if you multiply three numbers, that would give you the volume of a, of a box. But beyond that, what do you do? So like there were some, um, you know, some limitations to that way of thinking, but it's kind of convenient to think about it in that, in that perspective from time to time. Okay. And then like imagine, uh, is that making sense so far so good? So, and you could do the same for the other one. So you could like uh, put here um, f of x plus h, and here let me put um, g of x plus h. And so this other one will give you um, another rectangle. And so, this other rectangle would have area f of x plus h times g of x plus h. Okay. So this formula in a, from this perspective is kind of comparing the area between two rectangles. Of course, it's not 100% true in the sense it wouldn't be true all in all cases because in certain cases, you know, this the function for us functions can take negative number, it can be negative value, take negative values and things like that. And this suggests like, for example, that this is bigger than this number, and sometimes that's not the case. But I'm just saying, in there, there are certain situations where, like, this is actually would actually be true, and so we're just looking at this picture to have to have some sort of like uh, intuition of what could uh, happen. Okay, so it's not. I'm not saying that this is the case in every situation, but there are situations where this is actually true, and in those situations, this is more. It is some sort of comparison between areas. Okay. So in the cases where it, it, it kind of works, what you can do, like, and I actually, this is how um, you can find the like difference of square formulas and things like that, or is that, you, I mean, you can imagine like inserting this box inside this other box, right? So let's try to do that.
Uh, okay, and so if you do that, right, um, What's the difference? Uh, okay, there's, uh, how should I say this? If you do that, like it looks like the, um, you know, the, 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 the difference in areas, right? Should be this area, and this area, right? Is that making sense? Because again, we're subtracting the areas. So if you subtracted the areas, the 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 the, the leftover area would be this rectangle and this rectangle. Is that okay? Is that making sense with everyone? Um, so what's the area of the first rectangle? Let's uh, let's color it in green just to, to make sure we're all talking about the same thing. What would you say is the formula for the area of this rectangle? R remember like the formula of a rectangle, uh, the area of a rectangle is base times height, right? So what is the base in this case? f of x, what do you think is the height? Again, at least in this situation, you are comparing, this is like the difference, right? The, the entire blue segment was g of x plus h, right? So we are comparing like, you know, we're subtracting the blue segment from the pink se segment, right? So it is just this small piece, right? So that's how much g changed, right? So what was the name that we gave to how much G changes? Delta G, good, good. So this is Delta G. And uh, let's go through the other one. Let me see what color should I use for this one. Let's use brown. So again, what's the area of this rectangle? It is base times height. What is the base now? The base is like this, the length of this piece, right? What's the length of this piece? Is delta F good? Because that's how much F is changing perfect. And then you're multiplying it by the height Right, and the height is uh, g of x plus h. Is that making sense? So this is kind. Of, I mean, actually, this is kind of fun. So. What actually the limit we're dealing with is um, the limit. So this limit is actually, if you think about it as comparing areas, it is the limit as h goes to zero of the first area, which is f of x times delta g plus the second area, which is, uh, let me actually write, write it in the opposite way because um, in the formula for the, pro I'm going to write first the brown one. So it's going to be delta F times G of X plus H 
plus the green one. Divided by H. Is that making sense? So far, so good. And you see, like, this actually, if you have, like, in uh, hindsight, if you can go into look into the future, this starts taking the shape of the product rule because here there's a delta f that's going to be related with f prime, and here's a delta g, and that's going to be related with g prime. So you see, like, the derivatives do not appear multiplied together, they're kind of like into two different pieces. So where I'm, I'm actually, we'll finish today's class just finishing this limit proof. Um, so just to finish today, like, do you, you split this as a sum of two limits? Okay, and this is kind of like, um, this is like uh, the limit as h approaches zero of delta f over h times the limit as h approaches zero of g of x plus h. Right, so the limit of a product is the product of the limits. And then this is, uh, I mean, f of x here does not depend on uh, h. So you can take it out. Okay, but uh, the first one is literally f prime of x. The second one is just g of x because as h approaches zero, this gives you g of x. The second, the other one is f of x, and this other one, other one is literally g prime of x. Okay. Um, by the way, uh, in this one, like, not like it's not that I'm going to ask you to prove these things. Like, so like the proofs are just like just to give you like an idea of how the limit is actually used in practice. Uh, this one also uses the fact that g is continuous. Uh, which we know because if like the function had that derivative, it, it has to be continuous at that point. But um, so like, I'm just, you don't have to worry too much about like understanding every single detail of this proof. It's more like just to have like an idea of like, oh, limits are actually being used somewhere. In practice, the way we're going to use it is that literally you just need to remember this rule and then there will be concrete examples where you will, you know, apply it. So it's kind of more like along these lines that we will use and but this is more like to actually show you the idea behind it and to let you for you to you for you to see that actually limits are kind of in the background of what's going on. And that makes sense. But yeah, I think this is like a good place. I uh, mean, unless there are any questions, uh yeah, let me first ask if there are any questions. So yeah, so I'll it's, I think it's a good place to stop. I'll rejoin the Zoom chat like around three for office hours. If you have questions about your exam or anything else, feel free to join me. And also like if you have questions about the exam, feel free to email me. So it's whatever you prefer, uh, either works for me. So yeah, let's um, let's end here. And tomorrow we'll continue talking about this limit rule and uh, derivative rules and other things. Okay. But yeah, so I'll uh, start the chat again like in 10, 15 minutes. Good, have a good one.